for most of us, yes. Yeah, like, like, okay, this it. is a lecture for my uh, second hour class on the 20th of April. Uh, tomorrow you'll take your essay test, so be ready for that. Um, and you get to pick the battle, but make sure that you give the background and a thorough accounting of the battle, uh, name names and people and places, and uh, then then a conclusion or um, a summary of uh, what the battle, uh, a legacy, what the battle, uh, how it affected the outcome of the war, and 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 uh, so. Um, that will be tomorrow. Uh, anyway, um, we were talking about the assassination of President Lincoln and John Wilkes Booth shot the president at about 1015 in the evening on April 14th, Good Friday, April 14th, 1865. And then he left the theater. He broke his ankle uh, and hobbled out of the theater, got on a horse, and he headed to Virginia. Okay. Uh, and he got lost, and he determined that he was heading north to Pennsylvania, so he had to turn around, but he eventually makes it to Virginia. And uh, when he and there's the hat. I just, that's in the museum next door to Ford Theater. There's the hat that uh, Lincoln was wearing. Of course, it, this just touches off a huge manhunt. The Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, he takes over, and um, he, uh, uh, you know, posts this reward. There's a hundred thousand. That would be easily a million dollars today. Uh, this was probably the greatest manhunt up until this point, maybe the greatest manhunt ever uh, in the history of the United States. Uh, and they, and, and of course, Stanton sealed off all the exits to Washington, D.C. immediately, uh, just uh, as Lincoln had gasped out uh, his last his last breath. Um, um, but anyway, uh, I thought, well, I think I'm a little ahead of myself. Uh, but anyway, Booth got on his horse and he headed, he, he headed to Virginia, got lost, turns around. Uh, and, and in all of this, there had been this silence up there. Lincoln was back to the assassination. Lincoln was sitting in his chair. He hadn't fallen out, didn't flail his arms. He just was sitting there with his head, not a lot of blood, sitting there with his uh, head down, his chin on his chest. And all of a sudden, and, and people down there are startled. People are standing up and they're looking and they're saying, what was that? Is that a theater promotion? I mean, what does John Wilkes Booth do jumping out of the presidential box? And uh, all of a sudden they hear this piercing scream out of the presidential box. And that was Mrs. Lincoln because she had finally realized what had happened. And uh, Major Rathbone appears up uh, on the box. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. Major Rathbone appears... Um, here, you know, uh, with that bloody arm, and he shouts, is there a doctor in the house? Well, there happened to be three. One was sitting up here, and one was on the main floor. I don't know where the third one was, but the first two arrive in the box, and uh, the third one, he's a young doctor just out of medical school. He ran down the aisle and leaped up on the stage, uh, and uh, the actors literally lifted him up, and the other people in the box uh, just raised him right through the window there uh, or the opening on the presidential box. And of course, Lincoln is just still sitting in the chair while all this is going on, but they very carefully placed the president's body on the floor and they began to remove his tie and his vest and his shirt. And they began to search for the wound. And of course, Lincoln had thick hair. Okay. It was very coarse. He, he made a joke one time and he said, my last barber committed suicide. You know, he got so tired of trying to cut my hair and make it look good. Uh, and uh, they start feeling the president's head, and they come to the bullet hole, not very large, by the way, bullet hole right there about an inch above the president's left ear, and the doctor runs his finger in there uh, and pulls it out, and when he pulls it out, there's just kind of a, and it starts dripping blood, and uh, they put pressure <laughs> on the wound to stop the blood, but it's on the back of the head, and that part of your brain is called the medulla, and one of the things it does is it controls your breathing. You don't have to stop and think, inhale, exhale. <laughs> your brain does that, and when they put pressure on there, Lincoln would start to choke, and he would stop breathing, so they had a decision to make. You know, do they stop the bleeding and choke the president to death, or do they let, or do they let the president bleed to death? Because, you know, they immediately see the wound is mortal. He's not going to recover. <coughs> Pardon me. And so uh, 
they decided on the latter. They said, we will let the president <clears throat> bleed to death. And then the call goes out, you know, we need to take the president somewhere. Somebody said, well, we'll take him back to the White House. And one of his doctors said, if you put him in a carriage, take him, he'll be dead by the time he reaches the White House. Meanwhile, there's a large mob with torches that have gathered out in front of Ford's Theater. <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, the, um, uh, the they've gathered out in front of Ford's, and the um, there's a man over there named Peters uh, Peterson, excuse me, and he ran a boarding house, and it's still there. And you can you know if you go to Ford's Theater, just cross the street, you go up to Peterson's house, and just walk straight down the hallway, and you'll come to the room where the president died. The bed is still there. They used to have the pillow there. Uh, and you could literally see some of Lincoln's blood on the pillow, but I mean, it's been 160 years ago, or maybe 170 years ago, and uh, it had started to deteriorate. So they put that thing in a glass case and they've got it stored somewhere in the Smithsonian. And I'm sure it's an absolute dark to try and keep the deterioration from happening as much as possible. But one day that pillow is just going to disintegrate probably into feathers. But anyway, uh, you know, the Peterson yells, he came, they, all the noise had woke him up and he came out on his front porch and he said, what's going on? And somebody said, the president's been shot. And he said, well, bring him over here. So they, and, and this must have been quite a bit, but they pick Lincoln up in that little box and Lincoln is 6'4 and he's long and he's narrow and they move him out and they move him to the balcony and they go down that stairway with him. And then they carry him across the street and they just take him through. Like they come up the steps. There are steps on both sides of, of Peterson's house going up to the door. They go up the steps and they just carry him straight down the hall and they put him in a bed. And Lincoln was so tall that they had to uh, lie, place him at an angle across the bed. Uh, because if they just laid him straight up and down like you normally would sleep in a bed, his feet sort of hung off the end. So they laid him at an angle. And then they sit around until 7, 7.02 a.m., on April the, the, the uh, 15th, that's when he dies, April 15th, um, you know, and Mrs. Lincoln comes and she's so overcome with grief uh, that she says, uh, you know, uh, this is what they've done to my husband and she has to leave. And his son is there. Uh, members of the cabinet come in and they look at Lincoln and, and they just conduct a death watch. And they've got a young army private with a tablet there writing down everything that happens, okay, everything that is said. Uh, and finally, at, like I say, at 7.02 uh, a.m. on April 15th, Lincoln breathed his last. And um, um, uh, Edwin and cabinet members just start filing in. And Edwin Stanton, who was just absolutely ferocious, he used to, you know, he was a brilliant man. And, uh, you know, he, uh, I think he thought that Lincoln was pretty much a bumpkin hayseed when Lincoln appointed him to the cabinet and Lincoln would tell stories and he would just lash out at the president. Are you going to tell us another story for God's sake? We've got this war going on. Can't you be serious for a moment, Mr. President? And Lincoln unperturbed would just go ahead and tell the story and everybody would have a laugh except Stanton and then they would go on. But as the war went on, of course, Stanton, like everyone else, recognized the brilliance of Abraham Lincoln. And when Stanton comes through, and I doubt if he'd ever shed a tear in his life, but he literally was weeping profusely uh, at the death of the president. And he looked down at the president, and this young private is sitting there with a pencil writing, you know, everything that's happening, everybody that's in the room, everybody's comments. And Stanton had looked down at the president and said, now he belongs to the age. And at that point, the guy's pencil broke, okay, and he had to reach and find another pencil. Uh, and so uh, the, the quote usually attributed to Stanton when he looks on the dead president of the United States is really a great one. It says, now he belongs to the ages. But a lot of people who were there, or it's not a lot, but some people there said that what Stanton actually said was, now he belongs to the angels. We'll never know because the guy's pencil broke. Okay, but now he belongs. We'll, we'll go. I, I like now he now he belongs to the ages. That's all always associated with Lincoln. Also, Walt Whitman. I'm sure you've read some of his poetry. Walt Whitman, uh, who was a devoted fan, he was a poet. And he was a nurse in the Civil War. Um, he was a devoted uh, 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 supporter of Abraham Lincoln. He wrote the poem, Oh, Captain, My Captain. Have you read that? Oh, Captain, my captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every storm. The prize we sought is won. The ship was the Union. 
but at the very end, even though the, the ship gets through the storm, the captain dies getting the ship through the storm. And that's what that poem is about. Uh, and he wrote that uh, grief stricken. He wrote that over the death of Lincoln. Another one he wrote, it was, this happens at the Easter season and the traditional flower for Easter is the lilac. And he wrote another one called, uh, maybe you've read it, would lilac, lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed. If you read that, well, that's about the, you ought to read it. It's about the Lincoln. They're written about the same time. Uh, they are, that's about the, that poem is about the Lincoln assassination. It's interesting, Lincoln's life's mission to save the Union was complete. He was shot on April 14th, four years to the day of the shelling of Fort, of Fort Sumter. Uh, he was mortally wounded. He didn't die until the 15th, which was a Saturday, but he was mortally, more, uh, mortally wounded uh, on Good Friday, which is the day, according to Christianity, the day that Jesus was crucified. Christ died according to Christianity, to set the human race free from sin. Uh, and of course, Lincoln died uh, to set America free from slavery. Mary Lincoln said this later on. She said, and I quote, Mr. Lincoln knew he would have to die to pay for the war that he had caused. And quote. He had a dream about a week before his assassination that he couldn't, he, he couldn't sleep in the White House and he got up and he was just wandering through the rooms and everywhere he went, there were people that he couldn't identify, but they were weeping into a handkerchief. They were crying, and he could hear crying throughout the White House. And finally, he came into the East Room, and there was a coffin there. And uh, he asked someone standing there, who died? And the guy just pointed to the coffin, and Lincoln walked up and looked at the coffin, and it was him, okay? He had that dream about a week uh, before uh, his, his assassination. As I say, Mrs. Lincoln said, Mr. Lincoln knew he would have to die to pay for the war that he had caused. And of course, that night in his pockets, they found the coat. Remember, in the coat he was wearing in the pockets, they found two pairs of glasses and a Confederate five-dollar bill. Okay, that's that's what he had on him. Well, meanwhile, as I say, the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, took over. He sealed off Washington D.C. and he orchestrated the biggest manhunt, I guess, in U.S. history. And by the way, Stanton was convinced it was a conspiracy. And this is what this is the or, these are the orders that Stanton gave the cavalry who's going to take out to catch Booth. He said, "Bring him back alive." This is a conspiracy, and we want to know every person who was involved. Well, as I say, Booth, while all of this was going on, was racing through the Virginia countryside, and he stopped at the house of this man. Mary Todd. Uh, there's the reward poster again. Samuel Mudd, okay. You don't have to write him down, but it's just interesting. Samuel Mudd was a country doctor. Excuse me, teachers. At this time, we need the sophomores to report to the gym. Go straight to the gym, the sophomores. <clears throat> He was a country doctor. There weren't a lot of hospitals in those days. Hospitals maybe in the big cities, but out of the country, no. You had the local doctor. And, you know, if you sliced half your foot off while splitting wood, you simply bound it up as best you could, and they put you in a wagon. They drove you to the doctor, and he put you up on the kitchen table and sewed you up, okay? You had some sort of ailment. You went to the doctor's house or the doctor even made house calls and would come to your house. And so that's what this guy was. He was a country doctor uh, in Maryland. Okay. Uh, and uh, he was now practicing in Virginia. And of course he may have been a Confederate agent. He may have been involved uh, in this assassination plot. Um, but Booth arrives at his house at about 4 a.m. in the morning and he knocks on the door and Samuel Mudd goes and you know, there's this guy, and if he's not in on the plot, well, it was someone that, you know, he, he couldn't imagine. John, who's this famous actor we talked about yesterday? Chris what if he not, what if he had a knock on your door at four o'clock this morning and he was standing there? Okay, would you know who it was? If he'd been riding a horse all night with a broken ankle? Anyway, it's kind of scruffy looking anyway. Well, you get my point. The most famous actor in America is standing out on this guy's porch, and so he brings him in, and uh, he, you know, he's got this broken ankle. He tries to take the boot off, 
and this ankle, you know, in that stirrup, the ankle had swollen. And so Mud takes his knife. And there's that's in the museum next door to Fort Cedar, but that's the I'm not talking about riding boots that came up to your mid thighs. That's what you're talking about there. And he slit that to loosen it up, and he slid, slid the boot, boot off, and he fixed Booth's leg, okay? Kind of snapped it back in place and put a, as much as possible, put a bandage on it. And then Booth paid him, and he left. Well, of course, later, when they're rounding up all the members of this conspiracy, they're going to round him up uh, because they said he was a Confederate agent. I'm not quite convinced that that's true. It may be. He may have been a part of this, but I don't. Personally, this is just my, I, I don't think he was. I think he was a country doctor out there. Booth came along and that happened all the time to these country doctors. People showed up at all hours of the night and day, but he did set his leg and he is sentenced to prison and he loses his citizenship. Okay. For his part in this, they sent down to, to Florida. In fact, when I was a boy, when people used to have this saying and they would say, yeah, if you do that, your name will be mud. If you call, you've said to somebody, your name is mud. That meant you're the lowest of the low came from Dr. Samuel Mudd. Um, but he went to prison in Florida for 10 years. And of course, down in Florida, they had to constantly uh, battle the yellow fever epidemics. And he did admirable work. He saved, he practiced medicine, even though he'd lost his license. Uh, he uh, practiced medicine in this Florida prison and he saved uh, hundreds of lives. Um, but he lost his citizenship. And after 10 years, he was uh, released and he went back to Virginia, but he never got his citizenship back until President Jimmy Carter in 1978. Jimmy Carter pardoned posthumously. The guy was long since dead, but he pardoned posthumously Samuel Muds. But he's just one of the interesting characters in this. He well could have been, you know, Booth could have arranged, Booth could have, but, but that would have been odd because Booth had no idea that when he jumped off the stage, he was going to break his leg and all that sort of thing. But anyway, he may have, Samuel, Mudd, he did support that he was a Virginian. He did support the Confederacy during the war, uh, but that does not necessarily make him uh, uh, complicit uh, in the murder of the President of the United States. Well, Booth rode on. Cavalry was scouring the countryside trying to find him. This is a huge manhunt. And nine days after he killed the President, uh, on April 26, 1865, uh, he rode up early in the morning, completely exhausted, to a farm owned by a man named Garrett. There he is. That's not Garrett. That's Booth. To a man named Garrett who had a tobacco farm at Bowling Green, Virginia. And he said, uh, you know, do you have a room that I could sleep in? And, of course, he's, Booth is looking pretty scruffy by this point. And uh, I don't know. This guy probably had never been to very many stage plays. And he doesn't know who that is. And he looks out there and he sees him and he's got a wife and children inside. And, eh, I don't want to let this guy, I don't know in the house of my wife. I don't tell him who he is or what. So he told him, he said, well, he said, you see that tobacco barn over there? Yeah. Well, you can go sleep in that tobacco barn if you want to. Booth went good enough. Now, I don't know how much you know about tobacco barns. I actually harvested tobacco one time in North Carolina. So I know a little bit about them. But tobacco barns are tall affairs like this. You'll never see with this marker, but they're rather tall affairs like that. And starting at the very top, well, that's it for that one. <laughs> starting at the very top, they have uh, these uh, bars that go across the whole thing, okay? They're, they're round holes like that. It's just if we line this ceiling here, went to the very top, and put poles across there and then drop down a couple of feet and put another one, another one, another And they go all the way to the floor. And when you harvest tobacco, I don't know how much you know about it, but a tobacco plant's about this big. And the bottom, they have these big broad leaves and the bottom leaves will start turning about the color of that door back there. And when that happens, it's you know, you go through and you break them off. Uh, and then you have, uh, and then you roll them in a trailer and then you, take them to the tobacco barn. And of course there are women out there, women that they had, they've got these long, long sticks, you know, that big around. And uh, they sew those tobacco leaves on top of that. Okay. And so then you can just pick up that stick and you got a whole rack of tobacco. And then when you get people stand on all those racks all the way, and I've stood pretty tall up there, all the way up to the top of the barn, and then there are guys on the bottom, and they just start handing up those sticks of tobacco leaves. 
and you hang them up there. And, you know, you get a few at the very top, but as the roof widens out, you can hang more and more and more and more and more. And then when you get out of the floor, you've got them all the way across. And a tobacco barn, you know, it's, it's about as big as this part of this room right here. And uh, then they just line a little thing in the ground, and that just starts sending up smoke. And over a couple of weeks or so, I don't know how long, uh, it will all turn yellow. And when it turns yellow, then you take it down, and you take it to the tobacco sale, and you sell it. So that air can get into it, though, I guess my point is, they don't build the sides of the barn flush like that. They'll put a board, and then they'll leave a gap like that. So the side of the barn, and this is never going to work, the side of the barn, you get my drift, right? There's a gap between. And so you can stand here, and, you know, you can stand over there on the and I, and I can see you on the other side of the back barn. Look at those slats, okay? Well, so John Wilkes Booth goes out and sleeps in this barn. Well, no sooner he goes to sleep, the U.S. Cavalry shows up, and they go knock on this Garrett guy's door. And I guess he thought, I'm never going to get any sleep, but uh, he answers the door, and they have a wanted post. They've got a picture, and they said, have you ever seen this guy? And he said, yeah, he's right over there in my barn asleep. And so they surround the barn, uh, and they're under strict orders not to kill Booth. We want Booth alive. So they surround the barn. And, of course, you know, there are horses and there are men. And Booth hears that, and he wakes up, and he looks, and, aha, they've caught me. And so he just stands in the middle of the barn and starts firing through those slats. And the Union force of the uh, uh, cavalry, they're not firing They're not firing back. But they said, we'll smoke him out. How appropriate for a tobacco bar. And they light the barn on fire. And he's standing there wheezing and coughing and firing. And finally, there's Bowling Green. See, there's Washington. There's Bowling Green, just north of Richmond. Uh, this guy, um, a guy named... Um, Oh, what was his name? Corbett. His last name was Corbett. Boston Corbett. He was a sergeant. He was from Boston, Massachusetts. Or he was from Massachusetts. A lot of interesting people there this, this day. And he's sneaking around the barn with a rifle. And of course, everybody's under orders. Don't kill him. Uh, but uh, Boston Corbett here was a religious fanatic. And I mean, he was a fanatic. And let me explain what I'm talking about. When he was a young boy... 17 years old, he took his first trip to the big city, which was Boston. Never had been to a big city. Lived out on a little farm all of his life. And when he got there, he was seduced by a prostitute. And he is a devoutly, devoutly religious young man. Uh, and he knew, in his mind anyway, that he had sinned. And he was just crestfallen about that. And so he went to his pastor and he confessed and he prayed about it. And to make sure that he never fell into temptation again. And by the way, he wears his hair long. He's got it tied back, but he wore his hair long down to his shoulders to imitate Jesus, okay? What we think Jesus might have looked like. But to make sure that he never fell into um, uh, temptation again, he took his mother's shears, you know, and he castrated himself, okay? He neutered himself so that he would never again uh, be tempted by prostitutes. So he's there that morning and he's sneaking around the barn and it's smoky and he just dimly sees the figure of John Wilkes Booth and he just takes his rifle and lays it in one of those slats. I mean, he couldn't have been much further than I am from you and he, pow, shot him uh, and Booth fell. The bullet went right through his side and uh, damaged his spine. He's almost paralyzed from the chest down before his body hits the ground. And, of course, the commanding officer just runs up berating this guy, you idiot. He said, you've killed him, and we're under orders from the Secretary of War, for God's sake, not to kill him. Why in the hell did you do that? And he said, well, God told me to do it, okay? God told me to do it. And of course, you know, I've got a way. Who's got more authority, God or the Secretary of War? Well, I guess I'll go with God. So we shot him. Well, Booth wasn't dead. They carried him out, and they go in and get him, and they carry him out, and they lay him on the porch, and he lived for two more hours. And they all just sort of stood around, because nothing could be done. And they all sort of stood around waiting, and finally he opened his eyes, and they kind of look over at him, and he said, show me my hands. He couldn't raise his arm. He was paralyzed. So they picked his hands up, and they put his hands over his face like that, 
And he looked and he said, his last words were useless, useless. And then he died. Okay. So this guy didn't get any medals. But anyway, interesting people there that day. Um, by the way, there's the Surratt house, the Mary Surratt's boarding house where Booth and all these people I showed you, there it is today. It's a Chinese food restaurant, not very far from Ford's Theater, okay? But so anyway, um, they, um, they um, round up these conspirators. They get them all. <coughs> and four of them were sentenced to death including Mrs. Surratt. And here again, I have a problem with this. She may have been in on the conspiracy. But on the other hand, her son, who was sort of a ne'er-to-do-well, I mean, he's in his 30s and he's still living with his mother, for God's sake. But, uh, you know, he would come in and out all the time, never really had a steady job. You know the type. And he would come in and out uh, with all sorts of people into her house. And she's running a boarding house. Look at that. She's running. She's probably got 15 people. In those days... When you got a room at a boarding house, every day they cleaned your room, they made your bed, they changed your sheets twice a week, they fed you three meals a day, they did your laundry, washed your clothes, and ironed it. So she's working for 15 people. Uh, to me, she doesn't have a lot of time to say, now how are we going to kill the president? And she would notice her son coming in, and I'm sure she noticed her son coming in with none other than John Wilkes Booth. But, of course, this is close to Ford's Theater. John Wilkes Booth and other actors, some of them may have rented rooms from her when they were in town to do a performance at Ford's Theater. So it wasn't like, um, what's his name coming to your house today? I mean, you know, have you ever seen him before? Have you ever been to the, your house, just sat down and said, well, how you doing? No, but that could have happened here. So when she saw John Wilkes Booth, she probably thought, well, you know, I mean, my son has a lot of friends. Uh, and they would go in a room and shut the door, and that's where they plotted the. That's how. That's where the plan was made. That's how they plotted the murder of the president. But she was rounded up with the others, and she was hanged. There she is, right there. Okay, and I, I believe that was. Uh, I think that was a miscarriage of justice. We have to be very, very careful when something bad happens, because generally, what people want, they don't want justice; they want revenge. And I think in her case, it was revenge. Uh, you notice that she. Uh, uh, was dressed in black, and she's you see that's got that sh sash around her legs. That was you know here. Th this is this is eight nineteenth century propriety. Uh, they were about to kill her, but uh, they said when the see there's the floor that had dropped. When the floor drops, if we don't tie something around her knees, her dress will fly up, and people will see her legs. Well, you know when you're about to kill somebody, who really cares? But that's what they did. And by the way, until they dropped the floor. They had a guy stand behind her with a big umbrella uh, so the sun wouldn't hurt her, okay? She's about to be hanged, and they're worried about a little sunburn, okay? But they had someone stand over her with an umbrella, okay? Uh, and they, they, hanged, they hanged the others. Well, got this down. Andrew Johnson was sworn in. There he is. Andrew Johnson was sworn in as president of the United States. Andrew Johnson was sworn in as president of the United States. Uh, he had a cold. Uh, oh, I've left out a very important part of this uh, assassination. Speaking of Andrew Johnson, you know, they were going to kill the vice president. They were going to kill the secretary of state, um, Edwin um, William Seward, um, and they were going to kill Lincoln, and they were going to kill Grant. And uh, all those other people survived. Grant, I told you, he went off to New York with his wife. But Seward, interestingly enough, when they, the guy assigned to kill him, show you he's not the brightest bulb in the drawer, um, they told him, take this knife and stab Seward to death. Go to his house and stab him to death. So he's got his knife and he's got his orders. And uh, Seward that week had been his carriage overturned in the streets of Washington and he hurt his neck and they put him in a leather neck brace. You've seen people with that whiplash, same thing. I think they make them out of plastic today, but they had this thing on him and he was immobile. He couldn't really get up out of the bed. He was pretty well injured. And so this guy goes to his house and knocks on the door and Seward's son answered and said, 
when I help you, well, I want to see the Secretary of State. And he said, well, the Secretary of State isn't receiving people. He's been injured. And the guy just stabbed him. And he runs in upstairs. And, of course, all the servants start screaming. And he starts going from bedroom to bedroom. And uh, he finally comes into the sewage room. And there's poor sewer just lying there in bubble with his neck brace on. And, and Booth had said to him, you know, slash him in the neck. You know, cut the juggler there. You bleed him out real quick. And so the guy comes up and can you imagine Seward lying there in that bed? And all of a sudden somebody just appears over him with a big knife, you know, the guy. and, but the dummy, you know, starts stabbing him in the neck. That's what he was told. No, no original thought here. Just, uh, and it just keeps glancing off, you know, and, there's, uh, you know, and finally he stabs him in the chest a couple of times and runs. Okay. And Seward lived through it. Okay. Johnson, on the other hand, they went to his hotel and uh, he was, he had a bad cold. He was suffering from a horrible cold and he couldn't, uh, he wouldn't get up and answer the door. <laughs> the heck with it. I, just, I, just, I feel too bad. And that saved his life. Okay. The only one they got was Lincoln, but that assassination is certain. That's quite a thing. You know, I, you know, dummy. Anyway, well, Johnson was sworn in though uh, when the president was, when, when the president died. And, uh, you know, he has a bad start as president and it only gets worse. Johnson is always rated as one of our worst presidents. Uh, because of that cold, he took a large drink of brandy, okay, for the cold just before they swore him in. And he was a teetotaler. He didn't drink. Uh, and I assure you, if you don't drink, uh, that's just fine. Uh, but if you don't drink and someday when you're uh, of mature age and you decide you want to drink, uh, it's not probably good to start with brandy. OK, uh, Brandy, uh, from personal experience, let me just say, brand, and I'm old enough to drink Brandy. Brandy is is really a nice drink if you want to drink. If you never take a drink of alcohol, you haven't missed the damn thing. But if you want to, uh, but, uh, you know, a little bit of Brandy and you'll start hearing the angels sing. Well, the point is, the point is, is that when he got to his inauguration, he was drunk. And they swore him in. And then, you know, it was just supposed to be, well, we're just going to swear you in. I mean, this is uh, due to emergency circumstances. And there's no use to 